Sorry, boy. But his captain's got to teach his men what happens to those while crossing. Captain's got to teach stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning from the Bat Cave. It is Sabado, uh, July 20th, 2024. And I'm going to walk you guys through uh, the history of the Essenes first and then the Book of Jubilees. In my last one on this series, I covered the Book of the Giants and showed how the Book of the Giants influenced the, uh, the Book of Enoch and how they're both just uh, Jewish myth, Jewish fables that seem to be derived from um, cuneiform, uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, and, uh, and then just developed from there using just, just made-up BS, okay? Um, it's clear that these guys are going to try to bring in other secret knowledge that originated with the Babylonians having to do with um, basically uh, health and foods and stuff like that. And the reason they're doing this is because the uh, the ferret or the Essenes are just a cult of Pythagoreans. And I'm going to show you through Josephus and Hippolytus. They both know that they're a cult of Pythagoreans. The problem is... is is that in Josephus's day, at least, they don't necessarily see that as a problem. You got to remember Philo of Alexandria, who is actually, I think he's like the cousin or the nephew or the uncle of um, King Agrippa's uh, wife. He he is a big fan of Philo, or he's a big fan of Pythagoras. Okay, so the the Sadducees in that day were very much ensconced by uh, Greek philosophy and Plato and Philo and the Stoics in uh, Pythagoras and the Stoics. So the idea of there being a Pythagorean cult among them is not something that they saw as problematic. But I'm going to show you how the Essenes are, were actually, uh, pe people like to talk about them positively because Jesus never called them out specifically. But he did because the Zealots or the Sicarii, the people who were going around murdering people, were actually a sect of the Essenes. And most people don't know that. I'm going to show you that in Josephus and Hippolytus if you just bear with me, okay? So first of all, this is Josephus. Um, this is from his complete works, and this is book. Let's see. This is his. This is going to be book thirteen of uh, Josephus's um, Antiquities of the Jews. This is covering the period from the death of Judah Maccabeus to the death of Queen Alexandra, and Queen Alexandra is going to be the last of the Hasmonean dynasty before the Herods take over, basically. Her two sons are going to get into a civil war over who's going to rule the kingdom. And then, um, I always forget this guy's name. Uh, Pompey of Rome is going to basically um, sack Jerusalem and put a puppet on the throne after that, okay? So you're going to see Pompey. Uh, Pompey is actually going to be helped in... Uh, putting down this revolt by Herod the Great's or the first Herod, first King Herod's father, Antipas, and then Antipas is going to kind of turn on him and side with Caesar against him, and then um, he is going to be for for that he is going to be placed on the throne uh, in place of the Hasmoneans, and then he is going to have his son Herod marry a Hasmonean princess, and that's what kind of legitimizes him as a Jewish king, but he's actually an Edomite king. So this is going to be the section of history uh, before that. Um, the death of Judah Maccabeus, you're, you're looking at about a century of time here, okay? Now, he's he's covering this period, and in this period, it, it's going to roughly correspond to things that you're going to find in the book of First Maccabees, and um, one of the things he's going to talk about is the Essenes here. And... And he's first going to talk about, this is in chapter 5, section 8. He's talking about how after Jonathan, so I think this is Jonathan Hyrcanus. This is the one who uh, ends up basically making himself priest and king. He just doesn't call himself a king. But he, I think this is the one that calls himself the priest of the Most High God. He is going to send, this is in uh, First and Second Maccabees, but he's going to send a letter, or Second Maccabees, I think. He's going to send a letter to the Spartans um, acknowledging that they are not just friends, but they're related through Abraham, okay? So they're acknowledging that the Sea Peoples, remember the Sea Peoples are the Danites, okay? And so the Danites, even though they're not of the 12 tribes of Israel uh, anymore because they rejected their inheritance, um, they are going to um, still be considered relatives through children of Abraham, okay? And so um, he's going to talk about how they wrote a letter to them acknowledging their friendship. And because of this, 
the Spartans and the Jews have like an alliance, okay, in the days of the Maccabees, okay? And then he's going to say at this time, so this is during that period, the, there's three sects of Judaism, okay? And he says the three sects that exist are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, okay? Now he calls them Essenes, so if you want to look up this, you, you can download this for free. But if you want to look this up, you don't want to put in Essenes, you want to put in Essenes, otherwise you're not going to find it, okay? Um, Hippolytus is going to call them Essenes. Um, he's going to call them Essenes, and then if you uh, see it in the footnotes, in the footnotes, they'll call it Essenes, okay? So that's why it's not the easiest thing to find, and probably a lot of people have missed this. Um, but here's what he says. He says, um, now the Pharisees, they say that some actions, but not all, are the work of fate, and some of them are in our own power, and that they are liable to fate, but are not caused by fate, okay? So the, the kind of uh, determinism that, that a Pharisees could have, you could argue that it's kind of like a compatibilistic determinism, or you could argue that we have a free will in terms of our moral decisions, but not necessarily the physical outcome of our actions, right? Um, and that seems to be what it is. So I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, we probably have a similar view. Now, again, they say fate, Again, we, we understand that's God's um, rule over the creation, okay? So I don't use the term fate at all, but um, this is either somewhere between what I would believe, which is that God's ultimately in control of the physical outcomes of the universe, um, and he's, he, he, um, he, he has ways of controlling the different beings, but he doesn't ultimately control our moral will, okay? Okay. Um, that might be closer to what I believe. It might be closer to what a compatibilist Calvinist believes, okay? Um, the other sect, the Essenes, are complete fatalistic determinists. It says, but the sect of the Essenes affirms that fate governs all thing and nothing befalls men but what is according to determination, okay? So the Essenes are full-blown Calvinists, okay? The, 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 the Essenes believe that everybody was created for heaven or for hell at the beginning, and why? because they're a Pythagorean cult, okay? These are not real Jews. These are a Pythagorean cult, okay? So if you read Paul's epistles and you read the stuff he speaks against, he speaks against Jewish myths, old wives' tales, okay? Uh, he speaks about um, uh, people who forbid marriage and forbid uh, eating of foods. Um, and then he speaks against uh, endless genealogies. And all of those things, every single one of those things, are found in the Essene uh, literature. Now, they're going to claim that they don't forbid marriage, but in order to join them, you must voluntarily not marry, okay? And then what they're going to say is that, well, some of them actually do marry and have uh, wives, but it's sp only for the purpose of making more children because um, the only way the Essenes were growing was by adopting kids into their essentially monastic cult and then raising up those kids. So if you think these cults existed and they didn't have the same problems with pedophilia and buggery and all that stuff that was in the other monastic cults, you're, you're, you're deceiving yourself, okay? Because these are the origins of those other monastic cults, okay? And to think that these guys were following Pythagoreanism, they're following, it's, it's a pagan, it's a pagan uh, worldview, and um, some, and they think everything that happens is determined. So they're not really responsible for their actions, but somehow these guys were able to resist um, sexual temptation. It's absurd, okay? But these guys would have been the true, in, in terms of Judeo-Christianity, the true origin of the monastic cults, okay? M the monasteries and monastic systems are cults, okay? And Pythagoras, is the originator of all of that, okay? Before Pythagoras, um, you have these priesthoods of Egyptians, Magi, that's who he studied under, and then um, you know, you're gonna have the Levitical priesthood, okay? So you're gonna have these priestly sects, but these priesthoods are inherited. You don't join them, there's no way of joining them. And what Pythagoras does is he forms a kind of priesthood, and, and he, he's the first person to call himself a philosopher, but this priesthood that he's forming is dedicated to the god Apollos, which is Apollyon from the Bible. So it's literally the spirit behind the Antichrist, okay? And um, this priesthood is basically, he's gonna, he, he doesn't call it a priesthood, he just calls it, um, what does he call it? 
I forget what he calls it. Maybe it, I think he just calls it a school, okay? And this is really going to be the origin of Greek philosophy. You do have philosophers and teachers before them, but they don't call themselves philosophers, and they're just called sages, okay? You have the Greeks calling the, these guys the seven sages and guys like uh, Thales of Miletes and Solon, who is kind of the guy who's accredited with the founding of the first democracy. Like, those guys came before him, okay? And these were guys who basically had means and would travel around and study the wisdom of the Egyptians and other you know, cults and stuff like that and come back and be renowned for their wisdom. And yes, they would teach people, but they didn't have like a university or a club or a sect or a cult around them, okay? Um, Thales of Miletus is gonna be kind of the founder of this and Thales is gonna teach Pythagoras in his youth. And then Pythagoras is gonna go study under the Egyptian priests for 20 years. And then he's gonna be taken captive by the Achaemenids, I, for, I forget who it is, I think it's Artaxerxes, um, uh, to, uh, I think it's Babylon, and then he is going to study under the Magi for like 15, 20 years, okay? And then after that, he is going to come back, and he is going to basically start this school in southern Italy, which he's going to be the first person to call himself a philosopher, and this sect is going to make people basically listen for three years without talking, so this is where your monastic vows of silence come from before you can say anything and what you're really just doing is you're giving up all your possessions and you're being brainwashed okay you are not allowed to speak you're only allowed to listen for three years and when you begin to be allowed to speak you must be speaking in conformity to what they're saying so this is just a cult it's just a brainwashing cult okay and they're eventually going to be attacked by the people around them because they seem to be, just like Socrates, they seem to be criticizing the government and trying to establish how to form a better government. And so they get attacked by the people uh, around them. Um, I forget what happens, but exactly, um, I'll get into this later on when I read, go through the life of Pythagoras and all the details on that. But essentially, the cult burns to the ground and a bunch of people die inside. Now, I believe that um, the people of the cult that survived became the Druids and became the Essenes and became the Gnostics. That's what I think happened. Okay, but you're going to have people that went on and they were um, Pythagoreans and so you're going to have um, this sect, remember this is going to be about the 6th century BC of Pythagoreans is going to continue but also Pythagoreanism is going to influence Plato and Philo of Alexandria, and then uh, the Essenes are basically built around this. So just like the Pythagoreans, they make you have a three-year period of silence. Uh, basically, you're not allowed to talk, you're just allowed to listen and learn. They have all these secret names of angels that you have to learn, and you have to learn, like, they're, it's basically, basically like a pantheon of gods, but they just call them angels, and uh, you can't tell anybody these names. These are secrets, okay? And they claim to have these secret mystical doctrines that nobody else can um, learn unless they join their sect. But they just happen to line up with Babylonian paganism, which Pythagoras learned, and Pythagorean teaching about what foods you can and cannot eat, about not marrying, about all his beliefs about what's wrong with women, and about everything being fatalistically determined. Okay, They're just a Pythagorean cult. So they say that fate governs all things, and then the Sadducees, they take away fate and say there's no such thing, okay? So these are the basic divisions that you have in Christianity today, okay? You have the Essenes are basically like the Calvinists. They say fate controls everything. The Sadducees are like the Greek Orthodox, and they say fate controls nothing. Free will is supreme, okay? That's, that's what Origen taught. And then the Pharisees are kind of in the middle, and they're somewhere in between somebody... Um, you know, maybe like what a Baptist would think about determinism and what somebody like I would think of. That's kind of the spectrum the Pharisees are in. So they're kind of the middle ground, okay? And you're going to find this in every single facet of world religion. That's what I'm going through in my uh, book that I'm writing right now, A Serpent by the Way. You're going to find this in Egyptology. You're going to find this in Babylonianism. You're going to find this in Zoroastrianism. You're always going to have this division of two extremes. And one is basically going to say free will controls everything. And one's going to say fate controls everything. Okay, and it's like a will to power, which is going to be Nietzsche. Um, uh, and then you're going to have just uh, full on determinism, which is going to be Nietzsche's philosophy that becomes Nazism and Marx's philosophy, which becomes communism. 
okay? So you're always gonna have these two extremes. One is saying everything's controlled by fate, whether it's materialistic or spiritual, it doesn't matter. It's still just saying everything is determined by natural cause and effect. And then the other one is basically saying everything's determined by you, okay? So think Sarah Connor, we have no fate but what we make for ourselves, right? Versus um, a Calvinist, okay? So, um, so that's what the Essenes believe. They, um, but then he talks about of the Essenes that there are about the two sects and that of the Essenes they have treated accurately in the second book of Jewish affairs. Okay, so he he's just talk, he's telling you that the Essenes existed from the time of the Maccabees, and remember, many of the Jews were Hellenists by this time. Okay, so this is like. This is like 150 years deep into uh, after Alexander the Great's conquest. So Greek philosophy is very popular in Judaism. Okay, the the Sadducees are fans of it. The Essenes are definitely fans of it. The Pharisees less so. Okay, um, but they're all influenced by it. And there's at least one person that Josephus counts of the Essenes who be, he believes to be. Um, good at predicting the future. I don't know if he's necessarily saying he's a prophet, but he does say um, his predictions come true, okay? So here, this is on page 848. This is gonna be um, chapter 10 of, I believe, book 14. He's gonna say, the Ascends also we call a sect of ours and um, were excused from this imposition. These men lived the same kind of life as those who the Greeks call Pythagoreans. Okay, so they're a Pythagorean call. Concerning whom I shall discourse more fully elsewhere. However, it is fit to set down the reasons wherefore Herod had these Essenes in such honor. So apparently Herod liked the Essenes, okay? So listen to this. When, when, when Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herod, Herod honored the Essenes. Okay, and he probably liked John the Baptist because John the Baptist seemed like the Essenes. Okay, he's an ascetic, and he said so. Uh, Herod had the Essenes in such honor and thought higher of them than their mortal nature require. Nor will this account be unsuitable to the nature of this history, for I will show the opinion men had of the Essenes. Okay, now there's one of these Essenes named Manahem who had a testimony that he not only conducted his life in an excellent manner, but he for had foreknowledge of future events given to him by God also. This man once saw Herod when he was a child and going to school saluted him as the king of the Jews, but he, thinking either that he uh, did not know him or that he was in jest, put him in mind that he was a private man. So essentially, a scene pre an Essene predicts that Herod's going to be king, and that's why Herod is beholden to the Essenes, okay? So when Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herod, he is saying the leaven of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, okay? That's who Herod follows. Okay. Now, I didn't know this when I wrote my Rightly Dividing book. I hadn't read all this in detail, okay? Because I didn't know. I, I searched through Josephus for Essenes, but I didn't know it spelled Ascend. So I was searching through a hard copy of the book. Um, and it turns out, if you look up Ascends instead of Essenes, you find all this other information about them, okay? So Herod wasn't necessarily an Essene, but he revered them because they predicted that he was going to be king, Okay. So Jesus is rebuking the Essenes and their corruption. The zealots come from them, and also Herod follows their example, okay? He believes in them, okay? So, so you have a second scene, a scene around the turn of the century who may or may not have been Simon Magus, who is influencing the Herods uh, about uh, basically a changeover in government. So they seem to have this power of predicting the future in the minds of the Herods, okay? Now, uh, Josephus is going to go into more detail about the different sects that exist in Judaism now in his own day. And he says, The Jews had for a great, great while three sects of philosophy, remember, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, um, peculiar to themselves, the sect of the Essenes, the sect of the Sadducees, and the third sort of opinion was called the Pharisees, of which sects, although I've already spoken in the second book on the Jewish war, I will touch on them a little now, okay? 
So he says, the Pharisees live meanly, and that means moderately, and despise delicacies and diet, and they follow the conduct of reason, and what prescribes them for good they do, and they think they ought to earnestly strive to observe reason's dictates for practice. They also pay respect to such as are in years, and the, the, so in other words, elders, nor are they so bold as to contradict them in a thing which they have introduced. And when they determine that all things are done by f- uh, by fate, they do not take away the freedom from them as acting as they think fit, since their notion is that it has pleased God to make a temperament whereby what he wills is done, but so that the will of man can act virtuously and, or viciously. And so in other words, God controls the outcomes, but our moral will is up to us. So I would hold to something relatively close to what the Pharisees would hold to in terms of um, where God's uh, I'm going to just use the word sovereignty, but God's sovereignty and my free will interact, okay? He controls the ultimate un- outcomes. Our moral will is up to us. So that's what the Pharisees held, and Paul was a Pharisee, okay? So he says, they also believe that souls have an immortal rigor in them and that under the earth will be both rewards and punishments according as they have lived virtuously or viciously in this life and later are to be detained in an everlasting prison. Um, but the former will have power to revive again and on account of which doctrines they are greatly... Uh, to pursue the body of the people and whatsoever they do about divine worship, prayers, and sacrifices, they perform them according to the direction. Inasmuch as that the cities that give attestation to them on account of their entire virtuous conduct, both in the actions of their lives and their discourses also. So that's the Pharisees, okay? Because so the Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead. They do believe in eternal punishment and eternal prison, they call it. Um, and then he says, the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that the souls die with the bodies. They regard the observation of anything besides what the law enjoins them, so they only hold to the five books of Moses. For they think it is an instance of virtue to dispute with the teachers of philosophy with whom they frequent. So the Sadducees follow Greek philosophy. But this doctrine is received by but a few, yet those still of great of the greatest dignity. But they are able to do almost nothing of themselves, for when they become magistrates, they are unwillingly and by force, sometimes obliged to be, they addict themselves to the notions of the Pharisees, because the multitude would not otherwise bear them, okay? So what they're saying is that the Sadducees basically only believe in following the minimum law of Moses, but they mostly study Greek philosophy. However, when they attain to public office, like the priesthood, they follow the Pharisees' doctrine because they need to for public approval, okay? And then you have the Essenes. He says, the doctrine of the Essenes is this, that all things are best described by God. They teach the immortality of souls. They esteem that the rewards of the righteous are to be earnestly striven for, and when they send that they have dedicated to God what they have dedicated to God in the temple, they do not offer sacrifices. So they reject their obligation to go up to the temple three times a year for um, they have to go up for uh, Pentecost, Passover if they're able, but they they can do Passover in a foreign land if they need to. But they're supposed to go up for Pentecost. Uh, I think I think it's the Feast of Atonement, um, and the um, the. Um, Feast of Tabernacles. Those are the three that they're supposed to go up for, okay? And he says, because they have a more pure illustrations of their own, so they think they're too pure to go to the temple and obey God, okay? They literally place themselves as like next level saints, okay? On which account they are excluded from the common court of the temple, in other words, um, but, they're set, but they offer their sacrifices themselves, yet is their course of life better than that of other men, and they entirely addict themselves to husbandry. In other words, they're... they're um, Shepherds and farmers, okay? They all, it also deserves our admiration how much they exceed all our other men and that they addict themselves to virtue and in this righteousness and indeed to such a degree that it has never appeared among any other men, neither Greeks nor barbarians, nor not for a, a little time, so has endured a, a long while among them. That it is demonstrated by this institution of theirs, which they uh, will not suffer anything to hinder them from having all things in common, so they're communal, so that uh, a rich man enjoys no more of his own wealth than he who has nothing at all, for they are about 4,000 men that live in this way and neither marry wives nor are desirous to keep servants. So they're 4,000 celibate men, okay? As thinking the latter tempts men to be unjust and the former gives them to handle domestic quarrels. So they don't want servants, they don't want wives. But as they live by themselves, they minister one to another. They also appoint certain stewards to receive the incomes of the revenues and of the fruits of the ground, So such as good men, uh, such as our good men and priests who are who are to get their corn and their food ready for them. They, none of them differ from the other Essenes in their way of living, but they do resemble the Dake, which are called Poliste, dwellers in the city. So, so in other words, there are other Essenes that don't live in this single community, and you're going to find out that their community is Masada. 
Okay, um, this this is in um, Plotinus, I think. He says they live in Masada, which is where the um, Bar Kokhba revolt ended. Okay, that's where they live, and Qumran seems to be where they were before that. Okay, so Qumran gets destroyed in the in uh, 68 A.D. right before Jerusalem gets destroyed, and then at the Bar Kokhba revolt, um, Masada gets destroyed. Okay. So you're, or that's where all the Sakari or the Zealots or whatever kill themselves, okay? So it literally, all the Jewish rebellion is led by the Essenes, okay? Because they have literature that is telling you this is when the Jews are supposed to uh, throw off the Gentiles, and then after that, the Messiah is going to come, okay? And so what do you see happening in 70 AD and with Bar Kokhba? Exactly what the Essenes are teaching, okay? <clears throat> So he says, but the fourth sect of Jewish philosophy, Judas, Judas the Galilean was the author, okay? Now remember, this Judas the Galilean is covered in the book of Acts, okay? When Gamaliel gets up to kind of stand up for Peter and John in the book of Acts, this is going to be, I think, in Acts 6. No, this is going to be in Acts 5. When when uh, Gamaliel, which is Paul's teacher, is going to get up and kind of tell them, don't mess with the Christians because it will fall apart on its own if it's not from God. Um, he's going to say, Ye men, take heed to yourselves uh, what you intend to do touching these men. For before these days ro rose up Thutis, boasting of himself to be somebody. And when a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered... Uh, and brought to naught, okay? So whoever this is, this is somebody who started a revolt, okay? Then he said, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, so the days of the census, and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all as many as obeyed him were dispersed. So notice they're not, they didn't come to naught, they were just dispersed, okay? Well, Josephus is saying this Judas the Galilean was the author of the, um, the uh, zealots, okay? He says, these men agree in all other things with Pharisaic notions, but they have an invaluable attachment to liberty and say that God is their only ruler and Lord. So when Jude is saying um, they deny their only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's talking about these zealots, okay? Now, this is why I thought in my Rightly Dividing book that they came from the Pharisees, because it's saying this fourth sect um, follow Pharisaic notions, okay? But what we're going to learn is that they didn't come from the Pharisees, they came from the Essenes, okay? Now, they, they seem to follow Pharisees, they left the Essenes and, and they became the Zealots, but they are a sect that was originally of the Essenes, and the Essenes are, following, uh, are believing in the Jews overthrowing uh, the Gentiles around their day, okay? Which is going to lead to the Jewish revolt. And this is the philosophy that takes over Judaism which leads to the Jewish revolts, which lead to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is the demonic doctrine that Christ says is going to come back and lead to their destruction after all the demons he cast out are going to help this idea, okay? So it says, They do not value dying any kinds of death, nor indeed do they heed the deaths of their relations and friends, nor can they any such fear take uh, make them call any man Lord. So they'll, they'll rather die than um, call any man Lord but God, okay? but they won't call Jesus Lord either. And that's what Jude is calling out in Jude, okay? And so he says, in sense this immovable resolution of theirs is well known to many, I shall speak no further on this matter. I am afraid that anything I have said of them should be disbelieved, but rather fear that what I have said is beneath the resolution they show when they undergo pain. And it is in Gessius Floris' time that the nation began to grow mad with distemper, who was our procurator, who had occasioned the Jews to go wild with it by the abuse of his authority, and to make them revolt from the Roman, the Romans. These are the sects of Jewish philosophy, okay? So he's telling you that the Jewish revolts were started by the Sicarii, but he says they follow Pharisaic notions. I think later on he's going to say they come from the Essenes, but Hippolytus is definitely going to say they come from the Essenes, okay? So over here you see, and truly anyone would be, truly anyone would be surprised at Judas upon this occasion, he was of the sect of the Essenes, and he never failed or deceived men in his prediction before. Now this man saw Antigonus as he was passing along by the temple and cried out on this occasion. Um, 
there were not a, a, a few who attended him as his scholars. Oh, strange, said he, it's good for me to die now since truth is dead before me and somewhat I have foretold has proved false. For this Antigonus is this day alive who, who I ought to hear died this day in the place where he ought to be slain according to the fatal decree was Strato's Tower, which is at the uh, distance of 600 furlongs from this place. And yet four hours of the day are passed all over, which at point of time renders the prediction impossible to be fulfilled. And when the old man had said this, he was dejected in his mind, and so continued. But in a little time came the news that Antigonus was explained in a subterraneous place, which was itself called Strato's Tower, by the same which uh, name with that Caesarea, which lay by the seaside. And this ambiguity, it is called, uh, caught, is which caused the prophet's disorder. So apparently there was another Judas in the scene who uh, predicts the death of Antigonus, um, I think Antigonus is one of the Herods. No, so Antigonus is uh, one of the last of the um, Hasmoneans, and uh, apparently uh, one of the Essenes predict his death too, okay? And it just so happens the Herods replace them. So they seem to be um, prophesying against the Hasmoneans and in favor of the Herods. So that's why the Herods like them, okay? Now here he says... He talks about after um, Archelaus' ethnarchy, so Archelaus is a Herod, um, is reduced to a Roman province. He says, For there are three philosophical sects among the Jews, the followers of the first is the Pharisees, the second the Sadducees, the third sect, which pretends to a so, so, severer discipline is called the Ascends. These last are Jews by birth and seem to have a greater affection for one another than the other sects have. These ascends reject pleasures as evil and esteem continence and the conquest over our passions to be virtue. They neglect wedlock but choose out of other choose out other persons' children when they are pliable and fit for learning and esteem them to be their kindred and form them according to their own manners. So Jedi's and Padawans. Okay, that's that's who they are. They do absolutely deny the fitness of marriage and the succession of mankind thereby continued. Um, and they guard against lascivious behavior of women and are persuaded that none of them persevere to the fidelity of one man. So they think women are dirty. That's what it is. They think women are dirty. Why? Because they're influenced by Greek philosophy, by the Pythagoreans, okay? These men are despisers of riches and so very communicative as raises our admiration, nor is there anyone to be found among them that has more than the other. For it is law among them that those who come to them must let what they have in common be of the whole order inasmuch that among them there is no appearance of poverty and excess of riches, but everyone's possessions are intermingled, and every other possessions there is so, as it were, one patrimony among the brethren. They think that oil is a defilement, and if any one of them be anointed without his approbation and is wiped off his body, for they think to be sweaty is a good thing, and they also and also to be clothed in white garments. They also have stewards appointed to take care of their common affairs, who every one of them have no separate business for any, but what is for the uses of them all. They have no one certain city, but many of them dwell in any city, and if the, any of their sect come from other places, they have what lies open for them, just as if it were their own, and they go in uh, to such as they never knew before, and as if they had been long acquainted to them. For which reason they carry nothing at all with them, and they travel into the remotest parts, though they still take their weapons with them for fear of thieves. Accordingly, there is in every city where they live one appointed particularly to take care of strangers and to provide garments and other necessaries for them, but the habit and, and management of their bodies is such as children use who are in fear of their masters, for they do not allow of the change of, of or of shoes to be first torn to pieces or worn out by time, nor do they either buy or sell anything to one another, but every one of them gives what he has what he wants it and receives from him in lieu of what is convenient for himself, and although they, uh, there is no requital made, they are fully allowed to take what they want of whoever they please. So this sect exists in apartments all over the Roman Empire, um, and they're still there in Hippolytus's day, okay? The main sect comes from Ju uh, Judea, but apparently they have, it's, it's a cult, and so they have apartments and sects that people can come and go from all over the, all over the world, okay? As for their piety towards God, is very extraordinary. Before the sun rising, they speak not a word about profane manners. But they uh, put up certain prayers which they have uh, received from their forefathers as if 
they made a supplication for us rising. After this, every one of them are sent away by their curators to exercise some of the arts in which they are skilled, in which they labor with great diligence till the fifth hour, after which they assemble themselves together again into one place. Um, when they have clothed themselves in white veils, they bathe their bodies in cold water, and after the purification o is over, uh, everyone uh, meet together in an apartment of their own, which is not permitted for any other sect, any of any other sect to enter. While they go after a pure manner into a dining room and into a certain holy temple, they uh, quietly set themselves down, upon which the baker lays upon them loaves in order. Uh, the cook also brings a single plate of one sort of food and sets it before every one of them. But a priest says grace before me, and it is unlawful for anyone to taste of the food before grace is said. The same priest, when he has dined, says grace again after me. And when they begin and when they end, they praise God. And he that bestows their food upon them, after which they lay aside their white garments, and take to themselves their labors again until the evening, and then they return home for supper. After the same manner in which the strangers are there, they sit down with them, nor is there ever any clamor and disturbance to pollute their house. But they give everyone to leave to speak in their turn, which silence thus kept in the house appears to foreigners to be a tremendous, some tremendous mystery, the cause of which is perpetual sobriety they exercise, and the same settled measure of meat and drink that is allotted to them, and that which such is abundantly sufficient to them. And truly, as far as other things, they do, they do nothing according to the injunctions of their curators, only these things that are done um, among them at everyone's own free will, which they are to assist those that want it, and they show mercy, for they are permitted of their own accord to, to succor those that deserve it, and when they stand in need of it and bestow food on those that are in distress, they cannot give anything to their kind without the curators. They dispense their anger after just manner and restrain their passion. They are eminent for fidelity. They are ministers of peace. Whatever they say also is firmer than an oath, but swearing is avoided by them, and they esteem it worse than perjury. For they say, he who, who cannot be believed without swearing by God is already condemned. They also take great pains in studying the writings of the ancients and choose out of them which is at most for advantage for their soul and body and inquire after such roots and medicinal stones as may cure their, their distempers, okay? This herbal medicine and stuff like that that they have comes from the Pythagoreans, and you're going to see in um, the Book of Jubilees and in the Book of Enoch that they're trying to claim that this came from Enoch and Noah, okay? It didn't. It come, came from the Pythagoreans and the Babylonians, okay? But now, if anyone has mind to come over to their sect, he is not immediately admitted, but he has prescribed the same me method of living which they use for a year while he continues excluded. So he has to be among them for a year, practicing like they practice, but he's not considered one of them. And they give him also a small hatchet and aforementioned girdle and a white garment. And when he has given evidence during that time, then he can observe their continents. He approaches nearer to their way of may, uh, living and is made a partaker of the waters of purification. He is not even now admitted to live with them, okay? So just so you know, this is where the university system came from, okay? You're a freshman, you're a junior, you're a, or a sophomore, you're a junior, you're a senior, okay? This whole idea of three years before you're really considered one of them is how we get our bachelor's degree. It's first year, you're an initiate, that's a freshman, then you're a sophomore, you think you know, but you don't really know anything, then you're a junior, so you're kind of one of them, but you're just kind of following them. And then you're a senior, now you're really one of them, okay? And when you're done with your senior level, you get your bachelor's degree, okay? He said, yet he is not now admitted to live with them, for after this demonstration of his fortitude, his temper has tried for two more years, okay? Freshman, sophomore, junior. And if he appear to be worthy, then they admit him into their society. And, and after he is allowed to touch their common food, he is obliged to take tremendous oath that in the first place he will exercise piety towards God and that he will observe justice towards men and that he will do no harm to anyone, either of his own accord or by the command of others, that he will always hate the wicked and be assistant of the righteous, that he will ever show fidelity to all men and especially to those in authority because no one obtains the government without God's assistance and that if he be in authority, he will at no time ever abuse his authority nor endeavor to outshine his subjects, either in his garments or in any other finery, that he will be perpetually a lover of truth, or so a philosopher, and propose him to himself to reprove those that tell lies, that he will keep his hands clear from theft and his soul from unlawful gains, and that he will neither conceal anything from those of his sect nor discover any of their doctrines to others. So in other words, they teach a secret doctrine and you're not supposed to share with anyone. No, not through anyone should compel him, though to hazard his own life, 
Moreover, he swears to communicate their doctrines to no one otherwise than he has received them himself, that he will abstain from robbery, that he will equally preserve the books belonging to their sect, and the names of the angels or messengers. So remember, the books of Jubilees. Remember, these weren't widely publicized in their days. The book of Jubilees is known by the 5th century, but by then these guys are gone. Okay? They didn't publish the book of Jubilees and they didn't publish the book of Enoch because they were their secret books and the names of the angels that are in their books, they weren't allowed to tell anybody. Okay? It was a secret cult. So he says, these are the oaths by which they secure the proselytes to themselves. So the, you're going to find these angels named Mastema and Raphael and Uriel and all these other angels that aren't in the Bible anywhere. Okay? These are their secret books and these are their how they... Um, buying their proselytes that you're not supposed to share this with anybody which is why you don't you hear about the book of enoch being being cited by uh jude but only the first page of it why because this is probably something that the essenes are spreading around because the zealots came out of the essenes okay and they're saying enoch said this they're claiming to have a book of enoch but it doesn't seem to be w widely in publication okay but you have by the time of um, the the revolt you have breakaway sects of the Essenes so obviously they didn't hold to this but this was their original intent that these were their secret books that nobody was allowed to know unless they joined their cult okay they're Mormons they're just Mormons okay and then he says but for those who are thought and caught in heinous sins they cast them out of their society and he who is separated from them does often die after a miserable manner, but he is a, he is bound to take the oath he has taken, and by the customs he is engaged in, he is not at liberty to partake of that food that he meets with elsewhere, but is forced to eat grass and to famish the body with hunger till he perish. Okay? He says, for those who are caught in heinous sins, they cast them out of their society, and they're supposed to eat grass until they die because they're not allowed to eat the dirty food of others. That's how they atone for themselves. Do you see how sick this is? Remember what Paul says, doctrines of demons, forbidding, forbidding meats that are meant to be received with thanksgiving, and forbidding marriage. Doctrines of demons. Now, I think I mistakenly said in a previous episode that, that they didn't forbid marriage, but they clearly do. Okay? To be one of them, you must, you, you must forsake marriage. Okay? Um, there, we're going to find out there were certain of them because, again, it's 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 an original cult that's going to have um, denominations over time, right? And so some of those denominations do marry to procreate children for themselves. Otherwise, they're going to dissolve because people are not going to keep giving their children to this cult. That's really stupid, okay? And so eventually, they're going to start um, marrying and ha having kids, and then putting kind of putting away their wives or having the women as a separate thing. AKA monks and monks and nuns. Okay, because priests and the nuns, the monks, they were having sex. Okay? Um, this is exactly what happens. It's hypocrisy because none of this is ordained. Okay? But in the judgments they exercise, they're most ac accurate and, and just, nor do they pass sentence on the vote of their courts with, with a number fewer, fewer than 100. And as to what uh, is once determined by that number, it is unalterable. What, what they most of all honor after God himself in the name of their legislator Moses, whom if any, anyone blasphemes, he is punished capitally, they also think it a good thing to obey their elders in the major part. Accordingly, if ten of them sitting together, none of them will speak while the other nine are against it, but also avoid spitting in the midst of them or on the right side. Moreover, they are stricter than any other Jews in resting from their labors on the seventh day, and not only, uh, for they not only get their food ready the day before, but they are obliged to kindle a fire on that day, but they will not remove any vessel out of its place or go to stool thereon, okay? They won't go to the bathroom on the Sabbath. This is how crazy they are. Nay, on other days, they dig a, dig a small pit and a, and a foot deep with a paddle, um, which kind of hash is given to them when they are first admitted among them, and covering themselves round with a garment um, that they may not affront the divine ray of light, they ease themselves into a pit, after which uh, they put the earth that was dug onto it in the pit. And even this they do only in more lonely places, uh, which uh, they choose for this purpose. And although this easement of the body be natural, yet it is a rule with them to wash themselves after it as if it were a defilement to them. Okay, So they, will, they wash their hands after going to the bathroom. I don't think that's necessarily wrong. That's probably just good health. Um, but most people didn't do that. I go to India. They don't do that. They don't, they don't wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. They... they 
also don't wipe with their hands. They they use water. They use like a hose to spray their the, their bum instead of. Uh, but they don't wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. Okay. Um, So it looks like they do go to the bathroom on the Sabbath, but they go in a pit that they dug beforehand. They don't go into a pot or empty the pot, okay? Now, after the time of their preparatory trial is over, they are parted into four class, and so far there are juniors inferiors to the seniors that if the seniors should be touched by the juniors, they must wash themselves as if they had intermixed themselves with a company of a foreigner. See, do you see how this became the university system eventually? It started with the Pythagoreans, it became Plato's Academy, it then became the seminaries, and the seminaries became the university system. Okay? Yes, seminaries and universities are designed after a cult. Juniors and seniors. <laughs> like, they're, they're, they're called, um, uh, like, observers and hearers and stuff like that instead of freshmen and sophomores, and then juniors and seniors. See? So he says they are they are long they are long lived also in so much that many of them live above a hundred years and by means of simplicity or diet nay, I I think by means of regular course of life they observe also they condemn them they condemn the miseries of life and are above pain and by generosity of my, their mind and as for their death it will be for their glory they esteem it better than living always and indeed our war with the Romans gave abundant evidence what great souls they had in their trials wherein although they were tortured and distorted burned and torn in pieces. Uh, and went through all kinds of instruments of torment that they might be forced either to blaspheme their legislator or to eat what is forbidden to them. They could not be made to do either of them, nor uh, no, nor once to flatter their tormentors or to shed or tear. But they smiled in their very pains and laughed those to scorn who inflicted torments upon them and resigned upon their souls with great alacrity as is expecting uh, to receive um, them again. Okay, So he obviously holds them in high regard, but remember, so do the Herods because they predicted their rise, okay? They predicted the fall of the last Hasmonean, and they obviously predicted the rise of multiple Herods, okay? So one of them is going to be one of three commanders in, in the Jewish revolt, in basically the, the armies of the Jewish revolts, okay? And Qumran is going to be destroyed two years before um, Jerusalem is destroyed, okay? Now he says, for their doctrine is this, that their bodies are corruptible and the matter that they are made of is not permanent, but their souls are immortal and continue forever and that they come out of the most subtle air and they are united to their bodies as to prisons. Notice they are united to their bodies as to prisons. So they believe, they believe in the pre-existence of souls and that their bodies are prisons, okay? This you're going to hear in origin and origin's going to explain it as reincarnation, okay? into which they are drawn by a certain natural enticement, but that when they are set free from the bonds of the flesh, they then are released from long bondage, rejoice and mount upward, okay? So notice they're, they're basically platonic Gnostics. They believe our bodies are a prison, okay? Um, they don't believe in the resurrection of the body. And this is like the opinions of the Greek that good souls have their habitations beyond the ocean and in a region that is neither oppressed with storms or rain or snow with the intense heat, but that this place is such as re refreshed by the gentle br breathing of a west wind and is perpetually blowing from the ocean, while they allot to bad souls dark and tempestuous den full of never ceasing punishments. Okay, So they're saying our souls have pre-existence and they were either good or evil and they're in this body as a prison. This is what the Essenes believe. And indeed the Greeks seem to me to have followed the same notion when they allot the islands of the blessed uh, to their brave men, whom they call heroes and demigods, and, and to the souls of the wicked, uh, the region of the ungodly in Hades, where their fables uh, relate that such persons, such as Sisyphus and Tantalus and Ixion and Antidius are punished. Uh, now remember, he's this, this is Josephus, and he was a general in this revolt, okay? He's going to get captured, and he's going to surrender, but he's a general in this revolt. How does he know this? Because one of his commanders is an Essene. That's how he knows all these details, okay? And he says, which is built on the first supposition that souls are immortal, okay? When they mean immortal, they don't mean never-ending. They mean never-beginning either, okay? They mean the souls came from eternity, um, just like the Pythagoreans and the Platonists believe, okay? And thence are those exhortations to virtue and, and dehortations from wickedness collected, whereby good men are bettered in the conduct of their life by their hope. They have a reward after death, and thereby the vehement inclinations of bad men to vice are restrained by the fear and expectation therein. And although they should lie concealed for this life, they should suffer a mortal punishment after death, 
These are the divine doctrines of the Essenes, okay? So they do believe in eternal punishment, okay? So kind of a hell, but they believe these people are destined for this always because that's where they come and go from. They're either good and go to this body and then go back, or they're bad and they go to their body and go back, okay? Um, and about the soul, which lay an unavoidable bait for such as have once had a taste of their philosophy. There are also those among them who undertake to foretell things to come by reading the holy books and using several sorts of purification, being um, conversant with the discourses of the prophets, and it is but seldom that they missed in their predictions. So they're claiming that they study the prophets and they're often right in their predictions. Well, here's the problem. They weren't given authority to bind and loose the, the prophets. The apostles were. And so they are going to be wrong, and their being wrong is going to lead to the zealots and the, the Jewish revolt. Josephus doesn't know this, though, because their books are secret, okay? He doesn't have the book of Jubilees. He doesn't have the book of Enoch, which is why he's going to say stuff about the time of Enoch and about the origin of things that they say are in the book of Enoch, but he's not going to mention Enoch because it's a secret book in his day, okay? Moreover, there's another order of Essenes who agree with the rest of their way of living and customs and law, but differ them from a point in marriage as thinking that by marrying, uh, not by not marrying, they cut off the principal part of human life, which is the prospect of succession. Rather, that, that if all men should be of the same impision, the whole race of mankind would fail. So there are people of them who eventually start marrying, okay? But they start out as a celibate cult. However, they try their spouses for three years, and if they find that they have the natural purgations thrice as trials, that they are like to be fruitful, they actually marry them. They try their spouses for three years. What do they mean? It means they're sleeping with them for three years, but they won't marry them until they've met the qualifications of their cult, just like the boys do, okay? But they do not accompany their wives when they are with child, and as a demonstration, they do not marry out of regard for pleasure, um, but for sake of posterity. So they only do this to get the, the kids, okay? Remember, if you understand Platonic philosophy and Pythagorean philosophy, they believe that women are degenerate men and they're basically just vessels for producing children, just like Muslims believe. Muslims are actually based on, there was this guy named, I think it's like Moinamis or whatever, who mixed Pythagoreanism with um, the Pentateuch to come up with a, a version of Islam uh, like 300 years before Muhammad, okay? And that spread among the Arabians, okay? It didn't, wasn't widespread, but it very much influenced um, what became Islam, okay? Um, but for the sake of posterity, now the women go into the baths with some of their garments on as the men do uh, somewhat girded about them. And these are the customs of the orders of these scenes. But then as to the other two first orders mentioned, the Pharisees who are esteemed and most skillful in exact explication of their laws and introduce the first and introduce the first sect, these ascribe all to fate or providence and to God and yet allow uh, that to act what, what is right or on the contrary, is principally the power of men, although fate does cooperate in every action. So they do seem to believe in a form of compatibilism here, okay? And they say that all souls are incorruptible, but that the souls of good men are only are removed from their bodies, and that the souls of bad men are subject to eternal punishment. But the Sadducees uh, that compose the second order and take away fate entirely suppose that God is not concerned in our doing or what uh, or doing what is evil, and they say that um, to act what is good or what is evil is men's own choice and that the other and that one or the other belongs to everyone and they may act as they please. They also take away the belief of the immortal duration of the soul and the punishments and rewards in Hades. Moreover, the Pharisees are friendly to one another and are for the exercise of concord in regard for the published, but public, but the behavior of the Sadducees towards one another is in some degree wild and their conversation with those that are of their own party is as barbarous as if they were strangers to them. And this is what they have to say concerning the philosophic sects among the Jews, okay? So notice he's describing the, the Essenes a lot because one of his commanders is an Essene. So that's what Josephus has to said about him, say about him. Now we're gonna look at um, what Hippolytus has to say about him, okay? So here's Hippolytus talking about the Jewish sects. Now remember, before origin, Hippolytus was considered the renowned scholar in the Roman Empire, okay, the renowned Christian scholar, okay? He writes this book, um, Philo Philosomena, or, or um, Against all, this, uh, all the her Heresies or something like that, and he gets into, some of these books are missing, but he details the Egyptian mysteries, the beliefs of the Magi, Babylonian astrology, and all the Gnostic sects, all the known religions, 
all the known Jewish sects, all the known Christian beliefs, okay? And he accounts these things all the way up to his own day, including this guy Callistus, who was the guy who basically invented indulgences, okay? And he says this guy Callistus was actually the guy who um, spurned on the founding of what is now called modalism, okay? But he, he convinced another guy to be kind of the author of it or the main proponent of it so that he could make himself the bishop by claiming that he was made the bishop by his predecessor and then immediately um, denouncing that guy and then um, excommunicating him in order to um, give the appearance of his authority, which he knew everyone would agree with. Okay, So um, Hippolytus is saying he's a fraud and that um, Hippolytus was actually elected by the other elders as the next bishop. Okay, And then he's going to um, write tons of works that are going to be standard for the church for the next hundreds of years. Okay. Um, Origen is going to eventually supplant his ideas in the East, but it's going to be a secret doctrine, and so it's not going to be apparent, but it's going to creep in after Nicaea. Okay? So this is Hippolytus. He says, Originally there prevailed but one usage among the Jews, for one teacher was given to them by God, namely Moses, and one law by the same Moses. And there was one desert region and one Mount Sinai, for one God it was who legislated for all these Jews. But again, after they had crossed the River Jordan and inherited by Lot the conquered... Um, country, they in various ways rent and sunder the law of God, each devising a different interpretation of the declarations made by God, and in this way raised up for themselves teachers and invented doctrines of a heretical nature, and they continued to advance into sectarian divisions. Okay, so they're basically saying the Jews were once had one faith, but they eventually got corrupt and turned into sectarian divisions, just like the church did. Okay. Now it is the diversity of these Jews that I present uh, at present propose to explain, but though for even a considerable time they have been rent into new, very numerous sects, yet I intend to elucidate the more principal of them. So in other words, there's a whole bunch of different denominations of Jews, just like there are of Christians, but here's the main ones. It's like saying, okay, basically you have Catholics, Protestants, and, um, and uh, Orthodox, okay? It's like saying, he, here's the basic breakdown, okay? And Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox are kind of mirrored in the Pharisees, um, Sadducees, and Essenes. Okay, um, the Essenes are going to be more like the um, the Orthodox, um, very big into Pythagoras. The Pharisees are going to be more like the Catholics, and the um, <laughs> the Protestants are actually more like the Zealots because they're very violent and about sedition and overthrow and stuff like that. Okay, um, but the uh, no, the Sadducees are going to be, uh, yeah, more like your kind of Presbyterians, like um, your your preterists who don't believe in the resurrection of the dead and all this stuff. Okay, so he's saying, um, I'm going to elucidate the more principle, and in other words, the main sex, while those who are most studious uh, of more studious turn will easily become acquainted with the rest. So in other words, if you know these three, you're going to understand which. With the the rest are derived from, which is why that's what I do in my rightly dividing book. I say here's the main sex of Christianity, and you're going to understand when you meet other sects which ones they're derivative from if you read that book. Okay, now he says for there's a division amongst them into three sorts, and the adherents of the first are Pharisees, but of the second the Sadducees, and of the rest are Essenes. So there's three sects. Okay, and and these practice a more devotional life, being filled with mutual love and being temperate, and they turn away from every act of inordinate desire being averse to the hearing of things of all sort, and they renounce matrimony, but they take the boys of others and thus have the offspring begotten of them. So he seems to be getting this from Josephus, okay? Because this is very much like what Josephus says. And they lead these adopted children into the observance of their own peculiar customs, and in this way bring them up and impel them to learn the sciences. Um, they do not, however, forbid them to marry, though themselves refraining from matrimony. Women, however, even though they may be disposed to adhere to the same course of life, they do not admit, inasmuch as in no way whatever do they have confidence in women, okay? So they're saying that the boys that they adopt, they don't forbid them to marry, but they raise them up to be like them, and they themselves don't marry, okay? So basically, well, you can leave us and marry, kind of like an Amish person. Well, you can leave, you know, you're kind of cut off from your family, and you can leave and go live like the rest of the world, or you can come back. Well, if you come back, you're not going to marry like us, okay? So he says, the tenants of the Assessini, the they, they despise wealth and they turn away from sharing their goods with those that are destitute. 
Uh, no one amongst them, however, enjoys a great man of riches more than another, more regulation than this, that the individual coming forward to join the sect must sell his possessions and present the price of them to the community. And on receiving the money, the head of the order distributes to all according to their necessity. Um, thus, there is no one among them in distress, and they do not use oil regarding it as a defilement to be anointed, and they are appointed overseers that take care of things that belong to them, to all things in common, and they appear always in white clothing. So all of this seems to be coming from Josephus. It's almost identical. And then he says, and there's not one, one city of them, but they settle in every city. Now remember, in his day, they're still in these different cities, but um, their main cities of Qumran and Masada have been destroyed. Okay? And he says, so so they first were in Qumran, then they were in Masada, and then when Masada is destroyed, they're only in these apartment communities spread around the Roman Empire. Okay? Um, but remember, their Qumran community is destroyed in Josephus's day. Uh, the Masada community is going to be destroyed after Josephus. So that's their kind of backup stronghold. That's their helm's deep after um, Qumran gets destroyed. Okay? And it says, And if any of the adherents of the sect may be present from a strange place, they consider all things in common for him. And those whom they have not previously known, they receive as if they belong to their own household and kindred. And they traverse uh, their native land, and on each occasion they go on a journey, and they carry nothing except arms. And they also have in their cities a president who expends money collected for the purpose of procuring nothing, um, procuring clothing and food for them. So remember, they're, they're a sect of monks, but they're not pacifists. They carry arms with them wherever they go. Think about the Sakari. They're called the knife men, okay? These guys basically go around with a blade and they kill people, okay? So they're just going to be a group of them because they're all, they all go about armed, but the Sicarii are, are trying to um, basically bring to, for, bring to pass what they claim is fatalistically determined to come, which is the overthrow of the Romans after a certain amount of time. This is in the Book of Enoch, okay? So he says, and, and they come uh, also into their cities a president who expends money collected for this purpose in procuring clothing and food for them, and their robe and its shape are modest, and they do not have two cloaks or a double set of shoes, and when those that are in present use, use become antiqu antiquated, that then they adopt others, and they neither buy or sell anything, but whatever anyone has, uh, he gives to them uh, that has not, and that which one has not, he receives. So this is where people are gonna say, oh, um, if you have two cloaks, give to one who has one. They're going to say John the Baptist must have been an Essene, okay? Just because Jesus and John teach similar things to what the Essenes teach, remember, they do study the Law and the Prophets a lot, and a lot of their moral customs are going to be similar because they're all studying the Law and the Prophets, okay? Don't think they're getting it from the Essenes. This Essene is a sect. It's a cult, and they have different scriptures. They have secret scriptures and secret names of angels they account, which is all going to be the book of jubilees and the book of enoch and the book of the giants and stuff like that okay so then he says the tendency of the scene as sending continued uh they continue in an orderly manner and with perseverance pray from early dawn and they do not speak a word unless they praise god with a hymn and in this way they go forth and engage whatever employment they please after they worked a fifth hour of the day so all this i'm i'm, I'm not going to repeat all this because it's, it's all exactly from josephus and they pay attention to the president whatever injunctions they issue they obey as law um, for they are anxious of mercy and assistance to be extended to those who are burdened with toil. Um, they abstain from wrath and anger and all such passions as much as they consider these treacherous to men. Um, and then it says, then they evince the, the utmost curiosity concerning plants and stones, rather busying themselves in regard to the operative powers of these, saying that these things were not created in vain. What are they doing? What do you use plants and stones for? Pharmacology. They're into pharmacology, Okay. They're into pharmacia. These are uh, medicinalists. These are druggists. And they're getting this from the Pythagoreans, who are getting it from the Babylonians, who it seems to be came from this original tablet or, or stone or whatever that was dug up from before the flood. Okay, And according to the Book of Enoch, it came from angels. According to the Book of Jubilees, it came from Enoch. According to Josephus, it came from the descendants of Seth, and it was just their own learning about medicine and astronomy and agriculture and stuff like that but according to these guys it was from the watcher angels okay so they have different beliefs because these guys are worshipers of angels which is another thing paul points out against in colossians beware those who worship angels so he's saying beware the worship of angels he's saying beware uh jewish fables those who uh, abstain from meats and, and marriage or basically forbid eating meats and marriage which god meant to be holy 
and um, and uh, old wives' tales and stuff like that. So all these stuff he, he seems to be warning against are based on things the Essenes believe. Paul doesn't ever seem to name them as Essenes, though, but he, he does seem to be warning of their practices again and again, okay? So then he says, the tenets of the Essenes continued. But keep, keep in mind, Josephus, who calls them the Essenes, he's the first person who we actually have naming the Essenes in any ancient literature is Josephus, and that's going to be like 20, 30 years after the death of Paul, okay? So they might not be known by that name yet, and Josephus might just know because he has one of them as a commander, and so he knows what they're called now, okay? But it's they seem to be a very secretive cult, okay? Now it says, but to those who wish to become their disciples of this sect, they do not immediately deliver their rules unless they have previously tried them. So again, this is all from Josephus. Um, this is all from Josephus. And then he gets into this, different sects of the Essene, okay? Now he says, the Essenes, however, in the lapse of time have undergone divisions and they do not preserve their systems of training in a similar manner in as much as they have been split up into four parties. So he's saying the Essenes have been split up into four parties, okay? For some of them discipline themselves above the requisite rules of the order so that they even uh, will not handle a current coin of the country, so they won't handle currency because it's got an image on it, right? Saying that they ought not to carry or behold the fashion of an image, whereof there is no one that goes into the city, lest so by doing he should enter in the gate which the statutes have erected, regarding it a violation of law to pass beneath images. But the adherents of another party, if they happen to hear anyone maintaining a discussion concerning God and his laws, supposing such to be an uncircumcised person, they close, closely watch him. And when they meet a person of this description in any one place, they will threaten to kill him if he refuses to undergo the rite of cir circumcision. Okay? So this is one of the sects of the Essenes. What they do, remember, when the Maccabees took over, now remember, the Maccabees in their day have been, been overthrown. But when the Maccabees took over, they were forcing non-Jews to be circumcised and to keep the law. So what they're doing is they're saying when they hear anybody expounding on God and his law, they're going to find out if they're circumcised. Okay. Now remember, the Ebionites, the Ebionites are founded by a guy. Okay. The Ebionites, just so you know, are the sect um, that are founded by this guy, Serenthus, who was spying on John and Paul and Titus in the bathroom to see if they were circumcised. Okay. They're following them into the bathhouse and they're both saying they're ministers of Satan. Okay. Well, this is apparently a sect of the Essenes that does this. If they hear anybody talking about God and his laws, they're going to follow them around and see if they're circumcised. And if they are not circumcised, they're going to threaten to kill them. Okay? So when you hear about these people going around, now remember, there is a sect of the Pharisees that says this. And Josephus says, well, um, the, the, uh, the zealots follow after the customs of the Pharisees. Okay? That's what he says. So the zealots follow after the customs of the Pharisees. The, the, this, he's saying the zealots are a breakaway sect of the Essenes, okay? And they are basically saying they're going to follow somebody around and see, and, and if they don't undergo the right of circumcision, they're going to threaten to kill them, okay? Now, if the latter does not wish to comply with the request, uh, uh, the request, an Essene spares not, but even slaughters. In other words, he murders them, okay? And it is from this occurrence that they have received their appellation um, being denominated by some zeloti, but others sakari. Remember, all the scenes carry around swords. These ones will kill you if you're not circumcised. Okay? So you see why um, Paul is talking about these mutilators of the flesh. Remember, they carry around a knife and they're going to follow you and isolate you and threaten to kill you if you don't get circumcised. Okay? Paul is talking about these people like they're very evil. He calls them mutilators of the flesh. Those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh, I hope they die. Okay? They're not just these people who are trying to convince you to keep the law of Moses. There are people who are going around threatening to kill you if you don't get circumcised. Okay? Now, he says, in the adherence of another party, um, call on no Lord but the deity. Remember, they say no Lord but God, right? So he's saying this is another sect of the Essenes, okay? This is who Jude is speaking out against, okay? Even uh, though one should put them to torture or even kill them. Now, this is exactly who uh, Josephus is describing as the sect of the Essenes. But there are others of a later period who have such an extent declined from the discipline of the order that as far as those are concerned who continue in the primitive customs, they will not even touch these. And if they happen to come into contact with them, 
they immediately resort to ablution as if they have touched one belonging to an alien tribe, okay? So remember, this is Josephus talking. This is going to be about 100, 120 years after um, Josephus, and he's talking about the sects that have developed from the Essenes um, from their origin, okay? So he's mentioned the Zealots and Sakari. Apparently, these people who say no Lord but God is, is one sect. The people who will threaten to kill you if you don't get circumcised is another sect. So we see these two sects represented in Jude and represented in Galatians. Okay? So then he says, or in Galatians and also Philippians, and he's saying, beware these people of the circumcision, these mutilators of the flesh. Okay? Beware them. Okay? And he says that if they happen to come into contact with them, they immediately resort to ablution. So then they have another sect that think they're so pure, they watch themselves if they contact any of the other sects, okay? So they think they're the, 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 the purer ones, okay? So you have four sects of the Essenes that he's describing here. Um, the first one won't go near, won't, won't touch a coin or go into a city where there's an image. The second one will kill you if you won't get circumcised. The third one won't... Um, call anyone Lord but God. So in other words, they're not going to acknowledge any king or any Lord or anything like that. Okay, these these two right here, those are the Sakari and those are the Zealots essentially. Okay, those, these are the people who lead the Jewish revolts. Okay, and then the fourth one is just super holy and holier than thou, and they won't touch you. And if they accidentally do, they're going to wash themselves. Okay, so you have two holier than thou ones. They're all antisocial, and then two violent ones basically. Okay. And then he says, but here are there, there are many of them, let's see, and if they happen to come into contact with them, but here also are very many of them of so great a longevity as even to live longer than a hundred years. They assert therefore that of this cause arises their extreme devotion to religion and their condemnation of all excesses in regard to what is served up as food from their being temperate and incapable of anger. And so it is that they despise death, rejoicing that they can finish their course with a good conscience. Uh, if, however, any of them would even put the torture of persons of this description, description in order to induce any among them to speak evil of the law or or eat what what is offered to sacrifice as evil, he will not affect the purpose. For one of his parties submits to death and endures torment more than violate his conscience. Okay, So that seems to be pretty common among them. They'll rather die than give up their beliefs. Okay, They're very, um, they're, they're very Taliban-y in that way. Um, so it says the belief of the ascending in regard to the resurrection. Um, it says they acknowledge that both the flesh will rise again and will be immortal in the same manner as the soul is already imperishable. And they maintain that the soul, when separated from life, departs in one place, which is well ventilated and light somewhere, as they say it rests until judgment. Uh, this locality the Greeks were acquainted with, and here's say call it the Isles of the Blessed. And there are those uh, of other tenets which many of the Greeks have uh, appropriated, and thus which from time following their own uh, opinions for the disciplinary system regarded the divinity according to these Jewish sects is greater than any of that of all nations. So Josephus makes it sound like their their um, souls will go back to where they came from. He makes it sound like their souls basically are just going to depart into paradise until they get resurrected. Okay, um, So there does seem to be some distinction in what Hippolytus and Josephus believe they believe. Okay, um, And so it is that in the proof on one hand that all these Greeks venture to make assertions concerning God or concerning the creation of living things derive their principles from no other source, source than Jewish legislation. So what he's saying is that he's saying that the Greeks originally got it from them. So he seems to think the Essenes are older than the Pythagoreans. I don't believe that is true. The Pythagoreans are a few hundred years earlier than, than the known existence of the Essenes. Okay. Um, Maybe there were Essenes that existed in Egypt when Pythagoras went there. There certainly were Egypt. there certainly were Jews in Egypt when Pythagoras went there. Okay, because they um, were coming and going from Egypt, um, and after 587, which is um, Pythagoras is going to go, I think within 50 years of the destruction of Jerusalem, we know a lot of the Jews under Jeremiah went to Egypt. Okay, so maybe he learned some stuff from from the Jews, but this is not proper Judaism. Okay. And among those that they may uh, be particularized, Pythagoras especially, and the Stoics, who derived their, their systems while resident among the Egyptians by having become disciples of these Jews. So he thinks, and Tatian the Assyrian thinks this too, okay, that Pythagoras and the Stoics got their doctrines from the Jews in the first place, okay? So in other words, he thinks these Essenes are older than the Jews. Unfortunately, I think he's wrong there. I think they got it from Pythagoras, okay? 
Now they affirm that there will be both a judgment and... Con oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He, he's saying that they got their doctrines and belief about the resurrection of the dead and the conflagration of the universe from the Jews, which is probably true. Okay, That is something that seems to exist in Zoroastrianism, and they seem to have got it from the Jews, and from the Egyptians, and they seem to have got it from the Jews. Okay, There are later doctrines that emerge among the Egyptians and the Zoroastrians, but remember, the Jews are dispersed among them. Okay, And Daniel's the leader of the Magi. So... It says, so So it's he's saying that this they seem to have got, not all their doctrines, okay? And then he's saying, and among them is cultivated the practice of prophecy and the prediction of future events, okay? Now, this is mislabeled. It says another sect of the Essene, the Pharisees. He just said the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essene are the original three, okay? The Pharisees are not a sect of the Essenes. Um, whoever's translating this, Philip Schaff and his team are not paying attention because he says, then there is another order of Essenes who use the same customs prescribed in living with the foregoing of sex, but they make alteration in one of these sects, marriage. So here he's talking about what Josephus says, which is the sect that does allow marriage that came afterwards, okay? And that's the fifth sect he's gonna say, another sect of the Essenes. And then he says, um, after this he says, but there are others who, who themselves practice Jewish customs, and these both in respect and caste and respect of laws are called Pharisees, okay? So he this this part right here should be that fifth sect of the um, they they've got their chapter breaks in the wrong place okay this paragraph right here should be part of this chapter and then the Pharisees is the next one he's going to be talking about and he calls the Pharisees um, one of the first three sects and then he afterwards goes and describes um, this title describes the Pharisees as the sect of the Essenes that doesn't make sense. See, he's going to go on to describe the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You notice how he has a lot more about the scenes than he has about the Pharisees and the Sadducees? And the reason is, is because Josephus has a lot more about the scenes than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So almost everything he gets is from Josephus, with one exception, and that is that is that he, he is saying, Josephus just calls um, the Sakari or the Zealots a fourth philosophy that practices the customs of the Pharisees, Hippolytus is saying that the um, the that the, these four sects, these four philosophies, or the, he's not calling them the four philosophies, but he's he's describing. Um, let's see. He's describing four uh, four original sects of the Essenes, and then the fifth one that allows for marriage. Okay, so he's describing five total sects of Essenes. Okay. Um, and he is claiming that the Sakari, the Zealots, and the people who try to force circumcision all came from the Essenes. Okay. Now, the reason I believe this is true, and you're going to see this in my video on um, on uh, the Book of Enoch, is because in the Book of Enoch, it's it's accounting these seventy generations from um, basically the original Nephilim in the fall of the the Watchers until um, the overthrow of or until until the end of the world, basically. And he's saying that th these are in these s sets of seven, um, sets of ten generations. He's saying er, in, in the seventh, or in the sixth or the seventh, that the Gentiles get overthrown and the Jews basically rule the world. Okay? So he's describing a kind of, kind of like a millennium, but he basically says it's the Jews overthrowing, followed by the Messiah coming. Okay? So this is exactly the doctrine that they teach is what the Jews are going to believe in the last days to accept the Antichrist, okay? The Jews overthrowing all the surrounding Gentiles and becoming a dominant power in the world, followed by Messiah coming, okay? The Antichrist doctrine that the Jews are going to follow originated with the Book of Enoch, okay? Um, and I'm showing you right here, back in their day, the Antichrist doctrine that led to these guys um, being destroyed by the Romans started with the Essenes. The Zealots came from the Essenes, okay? So all the evidence we have is that when Jesus says that these demons are going to come back, and he says, beware the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Herodians, okay? The Herodians seem to be people who believe the Essenes. Because remember, the Essenes among the Herods are known for being able to accurately predict the future. They seem to be followers of the Essenes, okay? The, the zealots seem to be followers of the Essenes. And based on both Hippolytus and, um, and Josephus' treatment, they seem to be the most popular sect. 
The Pharisees and the Sadducees are pretty exclusive. Okay? The Essenes, yes, to be one of them is exclusive, but by their day, they have breakaway sects who are advocating overthrowing the Romans based on their prophecies. Okay? So I'm going to end that just as this description of, of the Essenes. And remember, this is coming from um, Hippolytus of, of Rome. Um, the book is. The Refutation of All Heresies. This is um, you can download this book uh, ANFO5 and that is going to be book 9. It's going to be around pages um, pages uh, 243 to 247. Okay? Um, right after he is actually going to describe this Moinimus, and this is Moinimus who uses the Pythagorean monad and describes him as um, the god of Moses. Okay, and this is where Islam is going to have its real root philosophy. Okay, so if if you are a pastor in this day and age, if you are a pastor and you care about doctrine, I would read this entire book. I would read it and I would know it well. Um, I'm not going to affirm absolutely everything in it, but most of it I would affirm, okay? This guy, this, this book, which is really about 250 pages, okay? Remember, we have some, we have some sections of it missing. Um, I have my, my suspicions that the Catholics have it, but they don't want you to see it because they don't want to know how much of their right comes from uh, the Egyptian mysteries. That's what I think, okay? But um, we have these... 10 books, it's about 250 pages, and it covers, it summarizes and covers all the different heresies and sects that existed in his day. And you want to know them because they're all re-emerging today. Okay? Every one of these sects are re-emerging on the internet. So when you watch Standing for Truth or you watch uh, All Things Eschatology and you listen to all these guys who are coming on with all these different strange doctrines and points of view, none of this is new. None of this is new. They're just recapitulating old philosophies from the past because they've heard stuff related to this, but they don't know where it comes from, okay? My book, Rightly Dividing, takes you through kind of the major trends in the trajectory of the church, but this book will teach you everything that exists in their day, so when you hear it, you can identify, oh, that's that sect. And then you can educate these fools on where their doctrine came from and how it's not scriptural, okay? So I'm gonna leave it at that, and then I'm gonna place this video as kind of like the intro to the series on the Essenes, and then after that, we're gonna do the Book of Jubilees next, okay? So I hope you guys are blessed by this. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Batman out, peace. Peace, I'm out, I'm Batman.